somebody needs to interrupt me, uh, you're going to have to intercede because I am blind. My the uh, uh, Zoom tile thing is behind the presentation on my computer screen. So uh, okay. let me just start, okay? And yeah, I'm gonna. Fine. I, that's fine. Okay, and as I mentioned to Tom and probably most of you heard, uh, let's see where we're at at uh, you know about 12:30. I'm quite sure we won't get through all this because my real point here is to have a little bit of a discussion and not me just running through the uh, the slides. So, uh, and this is focused on technology. It's not focused on all of the big bad stuff that's going on in in the world of economics and health and politics. Um, the article I wrote was published on uh, medium.com. I sent it out, I think, as, as part of the announcement for this. And so you can certainly read the article at your leisure. Um, and I published it on April 9th. That's the, uh, um, you know, uh, so it's almost, it's almost a month old already. And the world's changing. So a little bit about where we're at right now. Um, hey, Mitch. This is, yes. Mitch. Can I interrupt you for a second? Yes. Yes. <laughs> um, if you put your PowerPoint into presentation mode, we will see it much larger. Right now, we're seeing all of your controls as well, so the presentation part is small. Oh. Okay. Well. Hmm. Uh, or you can just move the barrier between the. You can turn off the animation pane page on pane on the right by clicking the right. Click on the icon for the. No. No. Wait, Mitch. The animation pane on the right, you can close that by clicking the X in its upper right-hand corner. That will make more space for the central panel. And then you, yes, and then you can move the barrier between the, the main panel. That There you go. Well, I was, I had to get it to where I was seeing it. I'm sorry. I, I Okay, now this I is much better. Okay. It's much better now. Thank okay, you. Okay, well, you, I thought you guys were seeing the full screen mode that I, I was seeing. Anyway, here we are. So, just a second. I, I'm, all right, so um, all right. So, um, oh wow, the animations are gone. Well, uh, so we're gonna talk a little bit about our uh, where we are and then the, the, the contents of the article are, uh, I talk about sustaining uh, the world in our lives, then moving people, moving stuff, making stuff, information management, how we innovate, and at the end, life is worth living. And we'll get to wherever we get to in about an hour, and then we'll see from there. Um, we all know. Mitch, yes. if, if you've got pres stuff that has to be animated, just go into presentation mode. It's the on the bottom uh, of the your, your screen. I was there, and it does, it, it's not a screen that shares for whatever reason. Oh, OK, sorry. Uh, no, it's, it, it worked yesterday with a different uh, group, but. Uh, anyway, um, so uh, anyway, so uh, we've all seen the obituaries, and these lists are far, far longer than they were in February. Um, wh whoops, jeez. Okay, uh, this is the old Summit Cheese Shop across from the train station, and uh, many hearts were broken here a few weeks ago when they uh, retired. Uh, Paul and Pam, for those of you who were, uh, frequented that store. But there's a lot of that going on. And even today's newspaper, there's uh, major chains are, are uh, throwing in the towel and just saying, we can't survive this. And uh, right here, uh, this is a, a mile long line for people to get food down in Egg Harbor. Um, so that's a, another sign of our times. And um, the, uh, well, I wonder if I can do this. Okay, so the, the uh, TSA passengers look like that, and all of that green is all non-passengers. That's no revenue, that's no, uh, uh, that's no hotels, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, you know, the airlines are hurting tremendously, the whole entertainment and travel industry is hurting. And uh, new vehicle sales, just another, you know, data point on what we all know, the, wor the countries, the world shut down. And so uh, nobody's buying cars. All right. All right. Um, 
and one of the things that they're advising us is to to stay at six feet and this is all part of the indoor air issue uh, and an outdoor air issue uh, but indoors uh, you know the pollution they say this uh, slide from BASF says two to five times more polluted air indoors than outdoors I think it's more like 10 times for the toxics um, and there's a lot of things along the bottom there that that are in our indoor air, but one of them is air, airborne part particles. And we're all advised to stay at least six feet away. And here's this guy coughing uh, a meter. And uh, what nobody says much about is the fact that the wind blows. And uh, so you could be three feet from somebody upwind and just fine and 20 feet from somebody downwind and not be fine. So as you're thinking about um, self distancing and, and isolation, uh, even with masks and stuff, if there's any kind of air movement, even indoor air movement, uh, be, in mind, be mindful of, of if you're upwind or downwind of people, um, and particularly outdoors in a, in a good wind. Um, so, and one of the things that's happened in the um, in the, the months since uh, January is this, that the air's gotten cleaner. You see the uh, before and after here, January versus February. So only basically a month later and the, the NO2 uh, concentrations over Beijing have gone from terrible to not bad at all. And similarly over our area, the uh, pollution concentrations have gone way down. I don't remember the dates on this, but um, uh, and I didn't put it in the notes. Anyway, point being, um, just by not traveling and not, uh, not, you know, and a lot of industries closed down, we're actually cleaning up the air. And what that means for a long-term solution, um, and this has nothing to do with the uh, uh, global warming that we talked about uh, here a couple weeks ago, but it's just interesting that the, uh, there are some good stuff about this whole COVID. Not many, but a few. So that's our, um, so at this point, um, you know, we could talk a little bit about, you know, air, air pollution and so forth, and at what cost, uh, if anybody has any, uh, any comments, um, Mark? Um, Raise your blue hand. Nobody, nobody's raising their hand at the moment. Okay. Uh, no problem. I'll keep on going. Um, and so uh, now I talked about moving people and moving stuff. The first thing is to move people. And uh, the lower left hand picture is all too familiar for us as everybody's going down the shore on Friday afternoon. And you think you're getting out of the out of the traffic jam when you get through the toll booth and you come on the other side of the toll booth and it's just as bad. So that's that's our history. Today, um, the traffic is light, the traffic is good. And um, part of what we've also seen is a, a movement in our, um, our travel habits and our, our um, mobility from the old fashioned taxis in New York that you see a picture of there uh, over to Uber and Lyft and a lot going on into our future with autonomous vehicles and where that all heads. But one thing uh, that people are starting to think about is the, that many, many um, knowledge workers in particular, knowledge workers have never been able to, um, been able to work at home. My, my son, for instance, works for the city of New York and they had an absolutely no telecommuting policy until about a month ago and now he's 100% working at home and when he goes back more than likely they'll have a some kind of a telecommuting policy let's just say one day a week well if you take 20% um, of the vehicles off the road or if you figure that the knowledge workers are only half of the now of the workers take 10% of the vehicles off the road that still does an amazing job on uh, the traffic density on our highways around well, around the world, but around the metro area. Uh, the other half, uh, the other part of that though, is if you take 10% uh, of the ridership out of Jersey Transit, that fundamentally alters their economics and their train needs and so forth. So that uh, 
it's all going to be different coming out the back end is the bottom line. And uh, one of the things with Uber and Lyft, as we're, we're thinking about returning to normal, um, you know, who wants to be around an Uber driver you don't know? And who wants to be in a, in a, in a vehicle that you don't know that might have contaminated surfaces? And we're going to get back to contaminated surfaces in a little bit here. But it's just the, 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 the moving people around is going to be different. And there should be an opportunity to accelerate the uh, movement towards autonomous vehicles. Yes, uh, Jim Landwehr has a question. Okay, go, Jim. Hi, Mitch. Uh, just uh, going back to what you're saying about the air pollution and the, the amazing uh, amount that it's cleaned up in China and in our region and other regions. Do you have you come across any estimate of whether to what extent that's due to just decreased driving or decreased driving and manufacturing shutdowns and so on. In other words, how much of it do you think or has anybody tried to figure out is just due to, uh, you know, de decreased transportation and driving? I have not looked into the research on that. I'm sure it will come out. Um, but, you know, and there's another image that I don't have on this slide that of uh, Northern Italy, Milano and all that area, and the same general idea. And uh, you know, it's, it's, it, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's all the sources of NOx. The, and the point is that if a lot of it is due to decreased driving, and if we get to a lot more electric cars over the next, say, 10 years, that could make a real difference in our climate, except, of course, then you have to say, how's the electricity going to get produced? <laughs> uh, the million dollar question. Uh, yeah, Jim, and, and Part of it is that, I mean, I just don't know the answer because I haven't looked at it. I just was collecting images just to make the point that this is a change and it will, and we, somebody will be looking at it. And I think there's probably uh, historic knowledge on uh, the print percent of contributions of NOx from, uh, from mobile sources versus fixed sources. Yeah. I just don't have it in front of me right now, okay. by okay. the way. I, yeah. I hadn't come across it either, but uh, no, I haven't looked very hard. Um, and by the way, uh, for those of you who heard that babble, NOx is N-O-X, which is a, a chemistry shorthand for mixtures of the various nitrogen oxides. And NO2 is the one that is measured in these uh, satellite videos, but uh, there are other nitrogen oxides and it, there's a bunch of complex chemistry, but that's the reason for that term NOx, because X stands for two or three. Um, anyway, so back to wherever I was. Yes, so uh, Roger Burns has a okay. comment or question. Uh, Mitch, ahead, hi. Uh, do you anticipate uh, colleges being forced to um, allow students to uh, study from home in the future and perhaps uh, cut tuitions a little bit? I mean, students are now being uh, told to uh, deal by computer. Sure. Um, first of all, I don't want to get into the various policy issues and uh, the economics of higher education, which is very, very bleak right now for the fall. Uh, but I will say, that, and it's, it, it comes up later in this thing, the technology of uh, communications and the technology of learning has rapidly changed and specifically um, look at what we're doing right here. Exactly. And, and you know, this is, and, and, and there's, uh, there's one, one step is to move to, to online with the same old technology of PowerPoints, et cetera. The next step is to uh, not only do that, but also have some of the tools that you can use to really, um, really, um, you know, in, enhance education. And the one example, which I, if you haven't seen it, there's, a, there's, there's something on YouTube. But if you get in the elevator in World Trade One to go up to the observation tower on, on floor 104, the elevator on all four panels of the, the elevator car has a video. And when you're at floor one, it's the scene from that spot in, oh, I don't know, 1610, 1620, doesn't matter before there was anything there other than Indians and, and forest. And then as you go up, you can see all of the very small buildings coming and then all of a sudden larger buildings, then the Brooklyn Bridge comes and yeah. blah, 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 until we get up to about the 90th floor. And then here comes the two World Trade Towers and then off they go. And, but it's a, it's a way to really visualize 
the, you know, the history of Manhattan. You can do those kinds of things. You don't have to have an elevator, of course, but you can do those things with geology. You can do those things with any number of, of the Western expansion. Um, and that's, that's just in history. Uh, so those are, those are the kinds of things I see us doing much more of is, is, is the, the overall uh, educational technology. But, but the actual hist uh, you know, prediction of what's going to happen with colleges, I mean, they've already had a lot of online learning, even at, you know, like Rutgers has always had, uh, or not always, you know, before COVID, they had online learning. And uh, to my way of thinking, uh, I started paying tuition at Rutgers, and my student was sitting in the dorm room taking a class uh, online. I'm not sure what I think about pay, paying my money for sitting in the dorm room, paying for the dorm room and an online class. So uh, uh, let, let, let's hold off on your, your question for a minute, Roger, until we get to the, the educational tech. Okay. Uh, uh, Ron Hoke has a question. Uh, yes. Hey, Ron, start over. Can you? We have too many run, running the controls. Ron, you're, you're unmuted. No, you're muted. OK. There you go, Ron. Go ahead. All right, fine. Uh, NOx is formed by a combustion process, either right. by burning nitrogen that's in the fuel or by oxidizing atmospheric nitrogen at the very high temperature that occurs in, in combustion. Uh, right. the, prob the problem with uh, automobiles is that it disperses NOx over a wide area and there's no way, no good way of controlling it uh, in an internal combustion engine. If we resort to electric vehicles, uh, that would be a great step forward. Even if the nitrogen, even if uh, electricity rather, is generated in a conventional uh, power, power plant situation uh, because it moves the NOx from being formed in a dispersed fashion by automobiles all, all over the place to point sources where the uh, formation of NOx can be controlled either by modifying the, the, the boiler design or by injecting uh, ammonia into the flue gas, which also controls NOx and removes NOx from the, uh, from the flue gas. So that's a big improvement. Ideally, of course, we would go to a way of generating electricity by renewals, such as uh, wind or, uh, or by uh, uh, solar energy. Uh, so uh, to get back to the original question, the biggest source of NOx uh, is uh, automobiles and the biggest reason why the uh, NOx formation has decreased is because of fewer drivers. Thank you, Ron. Um, and uh, uh, let's see, Sh who's up next, Mark? Okay, uh, Sri, uh, you have a question? Uh, yes. Hi, Rick. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, I missed your uh, question. You know, some of the things you're talking about, like the driverless car and things like that, I guess, you know, one may think about them more like aspirational, but uh, looking at the COVID and the technology usage, what are some of the things that are going on, for example, in tracking uh, the people's movement? Where are they concentrated? How can you control that? How can you mitigate that? And some other things that could be done in the near future, like say the eight to 12 months, where we can survive and sustain. Okay, uh, I'm going to come back to the issue of, of uh, tracking people when I get to the AI stuff. That's a, that's a big hot topic right now. Uh, the technology's there. Uh, it's been there uh, in terms, I mean, the phone company knows where your phone's going. Now, they don't necessarily know where you are going. If you want to put your phone in a car and have it go somewhere while you sit at home, that's fine. But by and large, you know, there's a strong correlation between where you are and where your phone is. So. Uh, and they've known, I mean, every time you're in a, you're talking on the phone while you're in your car, that, that phone signal bounces from cell tower to cell tower to cell tower, and they track that. And they don't, I mean, they have to track it because they have to keep the, they have to keep the phone call going. And so uh, the fact that it's associated with 
uh, your phone, they need to know that, but they don't need to know who you are. So there's a, there's a, a point where you can, uh, you can scrub out the personal data and just track the, the general, I mean, they've been doing this for quite a while and you can do some very interesting sociology experiments like uh, trying to figure out uh, where people go after the bars close in Morristown. I saw this one one time, that was really fascinating. And all of a sudden, two different cars go off in the same direction. And so there's been a hookup. Um, you, you can do all that kind of stuff. Uh, but but uh, Sri, the, the issue of the, uh, the uh, self-driving cars, you said it was aspirational. And, you know, there are plenty of, of uh, examples of, of uh, self-driving vehicles that are out there now. I mean, obviously, that we've had them for years. If you've ever been to Hartsfield Airport, uh, there's no driver in those cars. There's no driver in the uh, the little monorails at, at, at Newark either. Uh, but to get to, uh, you know, expanded cases on uh, open roads, that's that's coming uh, gradually. And I'm, I'm just saying I think it's going to accelerate. And whether that means it's going to accelerate from five years down to two years or from 20 years down to five years, we'll have to see as we go along. Um, Al, I think, is might be next. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, before that, can I, can I interject something? You know, the kind of things you're talking about. As a matter of fact, the other day I was watching a program where this uh, California company is already tracking not just only cell phone usage. He was looking at uh, people landing as in San Francisco or New York coming from China. And I think even National Institute of Health is looking at that AI, big data, all that good stuff. So there are a lot more activity going on. Going back to the automation, this is my two cents. If you look at the whole automation, automation is going on in the automobile industry, uh, in plants and things like that. All these things, even the vaccine also, a lot of them on paper, it is possible. By the time you make that, productize it, and then be able to sustain, uh, sustain the ongoing usage, it is going to be long time. I don't know, long time could be two years, three years, five years, 10 years, who nobody knows. But you know, that, that's what I meant by saying aspiration. It's not something that is uh, so-called shovel ready, you know, where you're able to dig in and start the construction. That's the point. Okay. Yeah, and and Sri, maybe it's worth maybe it's just worth uh, backing up a minute here and talking about the, the 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 phases of a disaster. We are in a disaster. The president has declared it so. Uh, it is you know covered under the Stafford Act, and we heard all about this from Mike Moriarty uh, a couple of weeks ago on that Thursday meeting. Um, we are still in what's called the response phase, and in the case of a hurricane. That means that the waters are high and people need rescuing and all that kind of stuff. If you go back to Sandy, the first, you know, hours, maybe day in a case, then it goes into the recovery phase. Well, this is a slow moving thing. We're not going to be in the recovery phase for, I don't know, months. And so, and the recovery phase from this thing will last for pick a number, one decade, two decades, three decades, who knows? But I mean, we're not done, we're not re done recovering from Sandy. So we're not gonna be done recovering from uh, COVID for a long, long time. And so, uh, you know, we, you know, I'm looking beyond just uh, getting through the crisis in, in, this, in this particular uh, discussion. Uh, you know, there's plenty of things that gotta be done right now, uh, whether it's, you know, masks or whatever so um and i think al's up next uh al aho is next yeah, yes mitch you you mentioned uh, remote learning and uh schools and universities uh not having in-class sessions for the foreseeable future um have you seen any studies of what the most effective learning methods are for remote learning um, no, and again, I, I'm not, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not looking at that specifically. I will tell you that um, I'm on a, uh, I've got a, uh, an appointment at, at Rutgers, uh, um, I forget the title, visiting scientist. And so I, you know, I started with the, talking with some of my guys about whether we need to get a proposal together to track that very stuff, uh, you know, because we got a perfect, uh, you know, petri edition right now of, of all the education and um i was told that 
no university administration wants to even know what the educational outcomes are were from this spring. They don't want to have the data in front of them. So uh, that pr that proposal was not even written, let alone submitted. Uh, but you know, it it there are people who are watching it uh, at, at all levels. Um, you know, K through whatever twenty, um, and it's it's you know, but the the educational um, edifice at all levels is is pretty monumental and. Uh, there's bricks and mortar and there's all sorts of other issues. But I think, I think that in general, the uh, educational system is ripe for a reform and this may be the, the time to kick it. Uh, and so again, we're, we're about 20 slides ahead. We're about, the discussion's about ahead by about 20 slides now. So um, I just wanna keep on going for a second here. Uh, one of the things that I like to just kind of think about is, um, the, the fact that, you know, a, a, a 2000 kilogram uh, SUV is a lot of mass and a lot of packaging to go around a uh, 70 kilogram human being. It's just, I mean, you know, we, we drive big vehicles in, in general, we collectively, Americans, we drive big vehicles and we, um, you know, we, we don't, uh, we don't scale the, uh, and, 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 you know, part of that thing, you know, we're looking at probably a, a sea change in the next few years from uh, owning ownership of uh, vehicles to a uh, fleet ownership where you, you use the vehicle on demand. And that's going to take a lot of changes in our habits. For starters, we can't treat our vehicle as a rolling closet. And so you're going to have to find another place to store your golf clubs and your, um, tennis rackets and whatever else uh, and so and then uh, this is a build with the the it's the Tesla car in the middle you know this is sort of the the uh, the, the car of the future if, if today okay you can buy Tesla's several models today uh, and and in the upper left hand corner is the um, is their their pickup truck that's going to be coming out in 21 and then down in the lower right hand corner is an electric uh, semi and there's all sorts of reasons that Elon Musk will tell you why an electric semi is a whole lot better than a uh, than a, a diesel powered one. Uh, but that's just their their cartoon view, and I don't know when they're thinking about putting them on the market. But the, you know that you know that's that's a here and now uh, and very near future kind of thing. Um, you know, in terms of the electric vehicles that Ron so eloquently argued was was a, a good way to be going in the future for a variety of reasons, not least of which is the uh, non-point pollution from uh, NOx. Um, and then, you know, the other thing is, uh, and this was animated, I'm sorry, but, you know, on the upper left-hand corner, that's people walking in, in New York City. Well, guess what? We've been walking since we were apes, and we still walk. And some people walk more than others and some people uh you know view this as just you know not but maybe the best way to walk in the woods or anything but it's there and then in the upper right hand corner this was a big deal what 15 years ago was the city bikes in new york and with the docks and everything and then a few years ago they came up with the idea well we don't have to have a dock you can just leave the bicycle wherever you are and this happens to be a picture i took in washington dc um but you see them in New York, you see them in any city now, the dockless bikes. And then, um, what was it, uh, two years ago now, March of, was it March of 18 or March of 19, when the scooters all of a sudden showed up in Santa Monica, California, unannounced, and they, they, the company didn't ask anybody's permission, they just, they just put them out there. And uh, the reason for that little circle there is to point out that all four of these women's uh, did not read the, uh, the the instructions on how to rent the scooter, where it said, "Do not uh, you know, use these with uh, flip flops." But there are all four of them got there. They're out there with their flip flops going going along. But you know, there's all of this personal transportation, and you know, other variants on the thing where you can you can get from here to there, um, you know, and in in short order. And a lot of times, a scooter or a bicycle is actually much faster in an urban environment than 
a car, even if you're in a taxi and you don't have to worry about parking. So there's a lot of this stuff that's been going on pre-COVID. And, uh, and then this is, this is just a, a vision of the future and from another slide deck that I have for another reason. But this guy's sitting in a car and instead of having windows that you look out the windows and you see whatever you're, you know, you're going by, uh, you know, the, the urban environment or whatever, he's now got virtual reality windows and he's looking at a beautiful uh, uh, seaside scene with flowers and so forth. And, you know, there's, there's no reason once you're, once you're in an autonomous vehicle and you're not driving, there's no particular reason that you need to have, uh, be, able, be able to see out the window. So you can, you know, reach, change the whole com complex of the thing. So this is all, all stuff that's coming along. Uh, one thing that is, is here and now, and again, sorry for the build, the, the good old uh, Jersey Transit buses, we all know them. Um, some of us have actually ridden on one once or twice. Uh, and here's Mercedes-Benz bus of the future. And look, it's the same general dimensions. It's still got a driver's seat. Uh, this, is their, this is their view of the future, and it's just not a lot different from, from old to new or current to future, if you want. But look here on the left, there's Ollie, and then there's the yellow thing. Both of these are autonomous. Both of these are designed for uh, holding six or eight people on a fixed route, uh, for instance, on a college campus, or my favorite, which I, I think will come, but I just, I don't know, is on 14th Street in, in New York, where they've, they've banned all of the cars. So if you put this thing on and people could just hop on and hop off every couple of blocks, I think these would be great for this. And, and the, these things currently now are in many places where they, they follow a fixed route. And so they don't have to worry about, uh, you know, any of the things that people are always talking about with, with autonomous vehicles. You know, what do you do when it's snowing? What do you do when you, you're on a gravel road and there's no paint, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. These things are in defined environments on defined routes right now. And this is, this is not future. This is right now. Um, and then the other thing that, again, this, sorry, this was a build. Uh, we've always talked about, um, the problems of, of, of uh, sh sharing a ride. And most people do not like the idea of sharing rides with strangers, like with Uber or something. But we've always shared rides with, with uh, elevators and they've always been, well, they haven't always been, but they've been autonomous for most of our lives. And most, you know, there, yes, there's an elevator with an operator somewhere in New York, but not very many of them. And so we're very comfortable with these things. Now, admittedly, this is a one dimensional ride, but still it's, um, you know, it, it, we do share rides and we do allow for a, autonomous operation. Uh, the cartoon in the right is, is from uh, uh, Tyson Krupps. And this is, uh, is something that they've been working on. And it's, it's the ropeless elevator concept. And basically, and there's YouTube videos on these that show up, but basically the elevator is on a track. So think of a, a taking a subway track and turning it vertical and then making, making it so that the, the device grabs the track rather than just simply sits on it with gravity. And so the, the elevators can go up and down. And the cool things about this are number one, you can have more than one elevator in a shaft. You can have several. And secondly, uh, and so the idea is if you can see on the right hand side of this, um, I don't know if you can see my cursor, there's two elevators going up, they get to the top, they go across, and then they come back down in a different shaft. But that also means if you can go up and across, that means you can also go across like this way to a separate, um, to a separate structure, which means the architects are going to have a heyday once they get this figured out and they can build new buildings that are not restricted, uh, that they can build buildings with, with less of the interior space devoted to elevators. Um, ropeless elevators, I think they're going to be a big, big deal. And so there's a lot of, lot of things going on with that. Um, but so two points on this slide. Number one, we already share rides. And number two, um, there's a future there that could be quite revolutionary. Um, so, uh, you know, we, we kind of have gone through just the moving people at this point. Um, 
does anybody have any any comments uh, about um, and we'll get back to the yuck factors in a little bit when I talk about um, sand, uh, uh, decontamination. Um, Paul, are you are you asking a question, or are you just have your hand raised for some other reason? Anybody else have any thoughts, or shall we keep going? Uh, hello, Ron Hoke. One of the things that we have to get away from is the idea that any new technology has to be perfect and solve all of our problems. Uh, as, as Mitch pointed out, if we can reduce uh, current systems that are causing problems by 10, 20, 30, 40 percent, that would be a, a, a big help. So we are probably going to look into a future where we'll have a whole series of different kinds of technologies. We can have uh, driverless vehicles that can go over uh, routes that are well defined, but in areas where they can't, uh, a different kind of vehicle uh, could be used. But if we could use that kind of a concept and reduce uh, the devices that create pollution and so forth by 56%, that might be enough to solve most of our problems. Indeed, Ron. And, and I mean, the whole issue of autonomous vehicles and uh, I talked about this a couple of years ago to you guys, uh, but you know the issue of autonomous vehicles uh, goes to um, you know a, a lot of things, and, and the most important thing is, and this has nothing to do with COVID, but let me just digress for a minute. Is the mobility for all? We have a series of people of, of people in this world who can't get where they need to go, notably, and you know for for uh, many of us. Uh, it's elderly people who just simply can't drive a car anymore. Uh, but the flip side of that is also true. The 12 year old has got to get to a violin lesson. And uh, there are you know, other disabled people. But the real big thing is the poor people, the, the people who can't afford to spend 9,000 bucks a year to have a car sitting in the garage, which is the US national average, $9,000. So if you got two cars in the garage, that's $18,000 a year. And most cars get used about an hour a day. So you're, you're basically wasting your capital asset about 95% of the time. And so there's a, I mean, it goes on and on with a whole lot of arguments like that, uh, the safety arguments and so forth. But part of what I'm thinking and the reason for this particular paper that I wrote and what I'm talking about you guys today is this, this COVID crisis is just going to catalyze a bunch of change that was already going, but this is going to just accelerate it. Uh, and it's going to, uh, you know, it's going to force us. And, and yeah, there's a lot of stuff in the medical area that I'm not going to talk about much today. I will talk a little bit, but um, anyway, so uh, Nolan. Yeah. Hi. Uh, I know I've said this to you, but I think it's worth everybody uh, hearing Nolan, this. Nolan um, is speaking right now. Yes, I hope so. Okay. Um, I know I've said this to Mitch before, but I think it's important for everybody to hear it. When are we going to get to 1%, 10%, 20% of vehicles being autonomous? It's not going to happen in personal auto. It's going to happen in commercial auto with the trucks. I have personal experience in the insurance industry. There's so many billions of dollars at stake. It's going to be a very bad future for truckers. Right now, they're making a fortune. You can't get enough of them. But I'm not giving up my car. But every corporation that looks at their bottom line and sees how expensive it is to pay these truckers versus machines that don't have overtime, that don't have benefits, that don't ever stop, that don't ask for anything. We've already got cores delivering their, their stuff is already being delivered in Colorado autonomously. So just, just a leading indicator for everybody to look at. I'm quite confident we're gonna see that before we're gonna see a mass movement towards personal. That's Which gets us into my next segment. Although I wanna say that I'm really proud of you, Nolan, for saying that Coors delivers stuff and not beer. <laughs> okay, so, so the, the, uh, the thing that Nolan was just talking about, moving stuff, um, there's a, you know, there's a whole uh, supply chain that we all rely on. And 
COVID has broken the medical supply chain big time. And, you know, we've all seen the, the, the everybody, you know, making masks and hand delivering them. Uh, we've all seen, uh, you know, and I'll get to this, but the supply chain is broken. And uh, when it comes back, it's going to be different. Um, grocery deliveries. And a question you can mull in your mind, and we'll talk about in a couple of minutes. Um, if Short Hills open tomorrow, would you go? And... And so drones and novel vehicles. So let me just walk through a couple of things on moving stuff. Um, you know, the, 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 the post office is under, under fire. The uh, US Postal Service is far and away the biggest uh, package delivery in the country, um, but they're quasi government and they're, they're a political football and every, everybody in Congress loves to, you know, string them out there until the very last minute and then save them and call a political uh, call it a political coup that they were able to uh, fund the post office. And I mean, that's a whole nother story about what, well, how we fund it, but the post office, and then we have all these trucks and I, I wanted to get a picture with all of the different delivery services all on one spot, but all, all I could do is this, but you've seen it on your block. You've seen, you know, UPS come by and five minutes later, DHL comes by and five minutes after that the post office comes by and somebody's going to figure out how to you know unify that delivery so that one guy comes up to your porch and he delivers three packages from three different uh services and your mail that's going to come how it comes when it comes i don't know but the post office is already mostly the reason they're staying afloat is because they have a contract with uh, amazon and that's been going on for three or four years i mean i saw my First time I saw it was about three years ago and my postman was wandering around on Saturday, Sunday and I said, what are you doing? He says, I'm delivering for Amazon. That was three years ago. Um, and uh, I mentioned how uh, there's a lot of packaging associated with a, uh, with a hauling a human around. There's a lot of packaging associated with hauling around all that stuff. If you go back to that, just the previous slide, those great big 20, 24 foot uh, step vans that, that the delivery services run around and there's a lot of pa a lot of iron being hauled around for f often quite small packages. So one example here on the left is a company called Starship Technologies and they are delivering groceries and these little things that look like a, a like a picnic cooler on six wheels. This happens to be a picture in Arlington, Virginia. There's similar p uh, testing going on in Mountain View right now. Uh, and basically, you know, they just go where they're told to go on a route. Um, you know, the, the computer, the, the mapping software knows where it's going to go. So you get your groceries and something like that. Or there are other, other options people are talking about autonomous vehicle, vehicles delivering groceries. And then here's a, an autonomous vehicle from a, a company called Embark, e -M -B sorry, E-M-B-A-R-K. And they're out of LA and it's a bunch of, it's a startup with a bunch of young kids and they're focusing on only the Phoenix to uh, LA uh, route. And what they do is they, they uh, put a driver in, this is right now, they put this driver in, driver gets it onto the, onto the highway up the exit ramp and so forth. And then the driver turns it over to the autopilot and then it goes over, over to Phoenix and then the driver takes over for the last mile or whatever but in between the driver doesn't count it doesn't count as uh as time on the uh, driver's uh log for for and so the 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 hall the the thing can go much farther and that's that's right today um and uh, you know i've only got a couple of them but it's a startup and the concept is to you know take these long long boring uh routes and and no one mentioned that what he didn't mention was the demographics of truck drivers they're all older now and getting older and they can't find enough of them. And as those guys get um, uh, retire, uh, we're gonna, we already have a labor shortage in long haul truckers. And, and, and so uh, moving stuff is, is changing. Uh, somebody has a hand. Yes, uh, Jim Blinn. Yes. Go ahead. Hi. Yeah, you were talking about the delivery of uh, packages. What I noticed a while back was, you know how uh, when we were growing up, there was something called the paper boy who would uh, bring your paper and then he'd show up once a week to collect 
for the week. And a while ago, that got changed over to where somebody drove by in a car and threw a paper in your driveway. And then the next step appears to be that there's magaz- there are paper delivery services, and it's one. It's not uh, each paper route isn't separate. This one guy who comes by with my paper brings papers for ten different uh, newspapers and throws mm-hmm. them in, in people's driveways. So that industry appears to have consolidated pretty well like that. But you can picture mm-hmm. that going over to the, if people still want to get paper, uh, a uh, autonomous vehicle coming by and throwing a paper in your driveway. Well, and as you know, uh, our area is anomalous, but a lot of areas in the country, the newspaper just quit printing. Um, Seattle, Detroit, a um, couple others I'm not thinking of right now, uh, uh, New Orleans, you know, they're, they're just, there isn't an option to go get a paper paper in a lot of those towns. Well, you can always get USA Today or the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, but the local paper doesn't exist anymore. So that industry is changing. And part of the issue in, in all of this stuff is, you know, what are the economics of change when you get the human out of the uh, equation? And, and back to the case of, of moving people for a second, if you take the human out of a car, the cost of an Uber ride goes down by about a factor of, well, it goes from, yeah, a factor of 10, $2 a mile to 20 cents a mile. So, you know, when you do that kind of a 10X uh, uh, economic shift, you know, things change. Good example, Erie Canal cut the price of, of uh, wheat in New York by a factor of 100 and all kinds of economic upheaval caused in the first half of the 19th century caused from that one. Um, of course, it wasn't just wheat that they were hauling on the Erie Canal. So yes, there's a lot of changes and, and a lot of efficiencies, uh, but you know, um, the paper paper, I still get two paper papers in my driveway, but um, probably not for long. Uh, let's see, where are we? Oh, and so automation, speaking of which, uh, on the left is a, a picture of a, a Amazon warehouse and the orange things down at the bottom are the robots and these robots come in underneath that whole stack of, of uh, bins there and then they, the, the robot raises up and, and lifts the, the, the entire stack off of, its, off of the floor and, and moves it to where the human pickers can then grab whatever it is out of the um, out of the bin that they need that they're assigned because you ordered it so that's the automation right now and has been and it's maturing all the time the robotics in places like Amazon uh, are, are you know just accelerating all the time because of the competition and the need to uh, cut the cost of delivery etc and then on the right is you've, you've all heard about the the drones that are going to uh, drop packages on our our uh, our deck or wherever mm-hmm. you, and and you know they're being tested um, there are some really cool stories in Africa of delivering uh, drugs and other things in in areas where you simply just can't get through physically on on because the roads are so crappy and so forth so uh that's all coming you know how we move stuff is is changing and i think now that we're uh thinking about um you know the post-covid era and our sensitivity to physically being together in a grocery store our sensitivity and again this doesn't have to be a hundred percent of us you know ordering online but even 10 10 or 20 percent shift uh, over you know the the next few years is going to be a revolutionary thing for um, for all of us and for the the and for the J crews that just won't be there anymore Um, so uh, and then wow I'm sorry Uh, it's got a mind of its own so and this is where we are today we're doing all kinds of things on a makeshift basis. We're having them uh, put crates of, uh, of groceries in our trunk and slam the trunk lid, and we don't have to um, we don't have to go in the store. 
we're going in the stores and they're, they've got the one-way arrows in the aisles. I mean, there's a lot of change in the last six weeks that, you know, it's just us trying to figure out how to make do with the current infrastructure when, and change our habits a little bit, not a lot, but, um, you know, and I know we had a whole conversation here a few weeks ago on ordering groceries and which, which services worked and which ones didn't and so forth. But when we come out the back end of this, I think a lot of people are going to find it just convenient to have, you know, Walgreens deliver, Stop, ShopRite deliver, uh, Walmart deliver, uh, sorry, Walmart, no, um, anyways, I mean, it's going to happen. And so, uh, and again, it doesn't have to happen with 100% of us, but there's going to be a significant number of us that just simply um, will, uh, and, and, our, and behind us are pictures of, uh, you know, liquor store uh, deliveries and all kind of stuff. And you, you guys know, all know this stuff. It's a, you know, I mean, drive up to the liquor store and they, they come out and throw the box of liquor in your trunk and slam the door and same, you know, across the board. Um, oh, interesting factoid. Uh, Target now says that the, the number of, of uh, people ordering uh, slacks and pants and jeans and so forth is way, way down. And the number of people who are wearing shirts and women's tops and so forth is way, way up, like by a factor of two. So everybody's buying whatever they need to look decent on Zoom and they don't give a, they don't care what they need to look like on, on the south end of your body. <laughs> but that's a real fact. I mean, it really is a big change in, in the numbers of, of sales of, of clothing. Uh, so, uh, you know, the medical supply chain's messed up. Uh, your shopping habits are not going to be the same in the new normal. And uh, the world's eating habits are changed. And, you know, we're going to, we're, we're doing more, we're getting more comfortable with uh, carry out and delivery. We're getting more comfortable with uh, uh, prefab. And I don't know, but, you know, I don't know what's going to happen with the 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 restaurant business whether it's a high-end steakhouse or a mcdonald's or diners in between like the, the one we just saw where um where our, our narrator spent the half an hour in the morristown diner i don't know but a lot of them i think are going to be like the summit cheese shop and not open up come uh whenever we declare uh COVID over any any uh questions comments uh um yeah uh Walt Meissner uh yeah go ahead Walt Walt are you there all right moving on okay uh Shri has something to say Go ahead, oh, go ahead. Shri, you're muted. Go hey, ahead, Shri. Yes. I have a question. This is Bobby. One question I have is, can you look at some of these technologies and how we have lot of unintended uh, consequences. And actually we have a lot of issues in the society. Now, for example, I'm not looking into course, social or political aspect of that, but just to look from a technology perspective. Yeah, we talked about education. Really talking about the element of education, lack of uh, desktops or computers or internet access. So the percentage of the population is almost not there. And a couple of days ago, I was watching an interview with uh, Bill Gates. Um, I guess I had a lot of somebody was asking, but the, uh, he, he was making a point for basic education and the middle high school online is not effective. Only when you go to higher education, that is more effective for all education because there is a level of understanding, this thing could be done. But the 
better question is who should be looking at the unintended consequences? For example, when we talked about uh, the telephones we carry around as a privacy issues, and then the Facebook and Google's uh, taking most of us for a ride. Now, these kind of things, who is somebody should be looking at any consequences? Or can it be done, or you just go with the flow? That's um, I think, uh, Sri, your 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 audio was muddled, but I got the unintended consequences, so I'm going to answer that part. There will be unintended consequences. There will be winners and losers. There will be um, bad things coming out of this. I mean, there already are many, many bad things coming out of COVID, and we have not yet seen the worst uh, on the medical side, nor on the economic or livelihood side. So it's 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 going to get ugly. But the unintended consequences. What I'm maintaining in in this article in this discussion is is that there will be some really cool positive things that, that society will be able to do coming out the back end of this thing. So that's where I'm headed with it, this this conversation. But yes, there's a lot of things and the educational thing. And, and just as one reminiscence here, uh, about three years ago, you'll remember in the middle of the summer, a game came out called Pokemon Go. And Pokemon Go is an app on a smartphone. And it came out on a Saturday. And I went up to uh, summer camp where there's no signal and uh, it's no cell signal uh, four days later. And I said, this Pokemon Go is really, it's really got everybody excited back in, back in civilization. And all the adults said, what's that? And all the kids said, yeah, I've been hearing about it. I can't wait to get home. So the kids figured this out even in a cell phone denied environment. And, you know, it just took off like a rocket. Point being, yeah, there's a problem with laptops and so forth, but that's a technology problem because we haven't figured out how to use these things, you know, and John was just holding up his thing. There, there's like 4 billion of these things in the world. You know, half the world's got a cell phone. So, you know, if we use that as the, as a software plant, plat, educational platform, we don't have to worry about laptops and iPads and all that kind of stuff. How that all gets shaken out, I don't know, but there's there's a lot going on in that. Um, uh, Jim, you wanted to, I think, uh, Mark, Mark, go ahead. Hi, so you said Jim, so am I on? Yeah. Yes. Okay, so, you know, one of the things that uh, Mayor de Blasio has been talking about, about the medical supply chain is, uh, you know, we can't be dependent upon the rest of the world. And so New York City has started to make a bunch of its own stuff. And so this all sounds like, well, it's good for a great idea, but in a, in a while, people are gonna figure out that that's really more expensive and yeah, it's important to have the supply chain uh, handy, but other people are gonna say, yeah, but it costs five times as much to make it here as it does in China. So uh, things will slip back to the old way as being my fear. What do you think? Uh, Jim, so we're gonna have artisanal face masks, huh? <laughs> uh, it, it, no, there's a reason why we've had the supply chain we've had there's a reason why we've gotten all of our Christmas ornaments from China for the last 20, 30 years. All of those things have a reason behind them, and that is because we'd much prefer to spend less money. And we've, we've done it with the, uh, the local um, haberdasher, and every, there used to be a, a men's and a women's store in every town, and those things are all going, going, gone. And we voted with our money. We collectively voted with our money. And so where we are now, um, yeah, there's going to be a period of time where we're going to pay premium prices for uh, medical stuff in the uh, in the emergency room, and um, and that's part of the reason why we're throwing trillions of dollars around right now is just because we don't know how to manage it other than to just throw money at the problem. But you know, and, and I don't want to go down that that particular way. But yes, uh, Jim, the the uh, the supply chain will get 
uh, re-examined and, and the, the beauty of a, a supply chain that involves, you know, making everything in China and sending it over here and selling it in the, in the stores for next to nothing. Um, the beauty of that is, is that we, we are spending like a quarter of our, our income on clothing. And I think it used to be a half. I mean, it, there's, there's all those ratios that are just way different now than they were, even if we were, when we were kids in terms of where our money goes. So that's all beautiful. But you know, any of these things that are, are, you know, like involve getting all the way from China, they're all fragile. I mean, we used to have the fragility in our, our younger years of, of the, the union strikes and all of a sudden something was all messed up, whether it was transportation or uh, oil or uh, whatever, because there was a union strike. We don't have those problems anymore. We have other problems. So, we, so there's always going to be a fragility of the, of, of the supply chain um, but coming out of this, it will be a little different, and we will um, you know, clearly uh, people are opting for more delivery and less going to the store in general. That's going to change. Um, but uh, uh, let's see, George hasn't had anything to say or hasn't had a chance. Yeah, I just had a quick question, uh, or and actually a comment. Um, the way things are going now with the PPP where they're trying to help employment by getting people to get back to work, putting them on the payroll. Uh, one of the big areas in small business that they missed are people who are, who own their own company. In other words, uh, let's say the husband and wife are the only employees of the company. And it turns out that that's fallen through the cracks and those people are not eligible for PPP. Um, I guess the question is, where do you see employment going, jobs going? In other words, it, it seems like uh, before this happened, we were basically a, uh, a service economy, with a technology economy on top of it. And now, um, and now it looks like the, the whole service part has just been blown away. Well, we still need a lot of services. I mean, we're a long way from having robots, uh, you know, clean facilities. We're a long way from having, and actually I'll get to some of the cleaning, robotic cleaning, but uh, there's a, we're a long way from having um, a lot of the, the service workers. Um, you know, we still wanna get uh, our Starbucks at Starbucks. I mean, we, we've, we since way before Starbucks or, or, or Dunkin' were even invented, we've always had the, the percolator at home, right? Or now the Keurig, but, I mean, and we still choose to do that. So there's a lot of that kind of stuff. There's a lot of stuff with, um, uh, you know, where, where we will have, um, uh, you know, jobs available. Uh, it's a, it's a, an age old problem. When this country was formed and George Washington was sleeping here, there and yonder, 98% uh, of the jobs were in agriculture. Now it's 2%. And somehow we've managed to get through all of that uh, when the car came in and, you know, around 120 years ago or so, um, the farriers, the, the blacksmiths, the, um, the harness makers, all of them, you know, they got put out of the buggy whip manufacturers. They all got put out of business. And, you know, here we are now with you know, uh, up until February, you know, full employment. So coming out the back end of this thing, you have to have a certain amount of faith and yeah, there's going to be more robotics. There's going to be more humans taken out of jobs. And in general, that's a good thing. I mean, we've taken the number of labor hours it takes to make a car uh, has gone down, 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 down for what, since World War II roughly. And we're all happy to have cars costing relatively less, although you sometimes wonder when you're on the car lot. But and just and you know i uh when you go buy a pair of blue jeans i don't think a human ever touched that in the factory i mean i don't know i've never actually been in a 
my textile mill in, in modern times, but I don't think humans, so we're taking humans out of a lot of equations. There'll be more humans taken out of the equations. And there are certainly issues associated with, um, you know, what do we do with people and jobs and, and that, and that's a whole nother conversation for another time. But personally, I just take it on faith that every time we've had another technological revolution where uh, the tractor replaced the horses on the farm, um, you know, we've still kept people employed with other, with other things. Um, well, let me just make one comment here. Yeah. In, in that um, 10 years ago, I was uh, working for a startup company and we decided to do manufacturing in China. And with the manufact, well, with the, with the device, we had set up where it would be totally automated testing. Well, when we sent it to the manufacturer, the first question was, how do we test this manually? It turns out in China, it's cheaper and easier for them to test devices manually than electronically, than automatically. So do you see us going in that direction where we're gonna now have to have jobs just for people to, to do things? Well, um, John's shaking his head no. Uh, I'm gonna take a personal uh, stab at that, George. Uh, and, you know, all of us were in, in college back in the 50s, 60s, whenever. And somewhere at our college was a little small office that we didn't even know about. And they did all of the governmental paperwork compliance stuff to send you know, whatever reporting they had to go into Washington. Same college today has a whole building full of those people. And so we've created a lot, and we got rid of all the secretaries, but we've created a lot of jobs of people just you know, reporting data here, there, and yonder, and Nolan's sitting there smiling because he remembers working at the, in the uh, insurance business and all of the various, you know, reporting that goes down to Washington. And, you know, back when you started, Nolan, a, a, a life insurance policy was probably three pages long, and now it's 103 pages long. I, you know, all this stuff, I'm just really scared, George, that when we come back, as we progress through the next... 20, 30, 40 years, we're just going to create lots of meaningless uh, paperwork that in theory, you know, the famous computer revolution should just take care of. And I'll give you one other example. We all had uh, taxes due here on April 15th. Whoops, July 15th. Those taxes take an incredible amount of time for all of us to fill out, even if we have a provider that does all the calculations, just to gather up all of the crap in your file cabinets and get it to the... There are countries like Australia and a couple of European countries, I think maybe Sweden. Anyway, there's a couple of countries. They basically send you your bill just exactly like you get a bill for your property taxes and you pay it. And if you don't like what they said, well, there's a, an appeal process. But, you know, I just um, turned in my taxes and um, a while later, I got a, a thing from the state of New Jersey and they said, hi, you, you forgot your, this amount, and they had a different withholding than I had, so I got an extra $140 back out of them. I'm not, try, I'm not complaining, but they know more about me and filling out my form than I do. And they, and they, you know, I mean, we all have those experiences. So I'm just concerned that we're gonna have more and more make work jobs is the bottom line. Um, I wanna just interrupt and talk with Tom one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. We're a little over an hour now. Uh, do you wanna call it quits here? Or do you wanna keep going or do you wanna take well, a call? Since you set the expectation that it should, that it's an hour, we, I mean, I would, you know, we can let the majority decide, but I would think that that's enough for today and we uh, reschedule again at the next convenient time that works out for you to continue. But uh, I, I can keep going, but I, I you know, we've been at this since 10 o'clock. So yeah, uh, I, I, I think it's, and we set the expectation at the beginning that we were going to end at 1230. So I think we should do that. That's my, that's my point of view. Anybody else want to comment? Agreed. Okay. I just want to mention uh, before we ring off, uh, 
we had 121 people max uh, during the main session. We started with 68. We're still at 47. So thanks for hanging in there, guys. Hey, everybody. And, and, can, and can, I have the mic? Can, I, can I have the mic before we ring off? Oh, yeah. I just want to finish my sentence. Uh, anyway, the point is, is that, uh, you know, this is, this is more than we would have ever had for a tug meeting in back when we were in the uh, council chambers. So, uh, you know, for what it's worth, people are hanging out. I know it's real easy to go off and, and grab a snack or grab another cup of coffee or whatever. Uh, anyway, uh, thanks for listening and thanks for chiming in. And uh, uh, Paul, before you get to send the end of it, uh, Herb's got something to say. Herb Waddell? Sorry, Herb. Yeah, I just want to add my comments. To, to okay, Herb, Herb, that. I think we finally yeah, got I, I didn't realize I had to unmute myself. I just wanted to say, Mitch, I'm collecting stuff for junk day. I found a silver-plated percolator, which I'm throwing out. So if you're interested, you can have it. Still probably makes good coffee after 30 years. I mean, those things, they were indestructible. So um, let's see, Tom, you want to yeah. say something? And then I, I think Paul wants to say thank you, Mitch, because you've put in a lot of effort into this. I know it's one of your the areas that you're extremely interested in. We appreciate you sharing it with us. And you did it on relatively short notice. I'll work with you offline as to when it would be good to continue this at some future session. And um, thank you very much. I appreciate it. And uh, 